This is the southwest corner of 4th and Cook Streets, now a vacant lot since the YMCA has recently been torn down. We've come full circle. 78 years ago in July 1943, this corner was also just a vacant lot. But for six days, this became a sea of activity for the auction of Susan Lawrence Dana's belongings. The most famous and largest auction in Springfield marks its 78th anniversary this week. That was the auction of the extensive collections of Susan Lawrence Dana, socialite and world traveler who had her house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. There was so much to sell that it took six days, two sessions per day. Tonight, we want to share a little about this amazing woman, the excitement that built throughout the city and the state prior to the auction, the items that were offered up to the highest bidder, and the activities during the auction itself. We will identify items that were sold. We will share stories of the efforts by the Dana Thomas House Foundation, the late Governor James Thompson, the state, and others to reacquire items that had been sold at the auction. Some items we can trace to purchases at later auctions or through private owners and through donations. Some history and important dates that may help are 1943, the year the auction was held, 1944 through 1981, the years that Charles Thomas Publishing Company used the house for its headquarters, 1981, the year in which the state purchased the house for $1 million, and finally, 1983, the year that the Dana Thomas House Foundation formed and work began to raise money to acquire items. At this time, we acknowledge the work of the late Governor James Thompson, who was interested in historic preservation, was an antique dealer himself, and worked tirelessly to get the home purchased by the state. He supported fundraising efforts to acquire items for the house and supported the foundation. No records exist listing sale prices of items. We only know what some items brought at the auction through newspaper articles or from a family story about someone who attended the auction. Some items were kept in the house, such as the dining room table and chairs. We will talk about the furniture later. It was July 1943, hot, humid, and muggy as Springfield can be. Auction attendees would have dressed in the latest fashions that no doubt added to the heat. It was also the middle of World War II when air raid practices were often scheduled at night, during which lights were shut off throughout the city. Word had spread that an auction the likes of which hadn't been seen would be happening toward the end of the month. Newspaper articles, displays of items in stores, visitors from out of town all built interest. But why was there such interest in this auction? because it was the estate of Susan Lauren Stana, a wealthy socialite who was known to entertain lavishly and travel extensively. She was affectionately called Aunt Susie, and many adults remembered attending tea parties at her home when they were children. Others remembered her for her work in the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Springfield Women's Club, and as a supporter of the Lincoln Colored Home. Still others remembered her as an activist for women's rights, equal rights, and education. She often lobbied for these issues at the Capitol. And to Springfield, she was an enigma, a lady who lived in a house that looked so different from the others. Born in 1862, Susan called Aunt Susie, her father Runa, and mother Mary were prominent citizens of Springfield. Runa later served as mayor and president of the school board. Mary was active in community work and philanthropy. Susan married three times. Her first husband, Edwin Dana, was killed in a mining accident, and the couple lost two infant children during their marriage. Her second husband, Jorgen Constantine Dahl, was a singer from Denmark. They met in Chicago. They were married when she was 49. He was 26. He died a year after they married. 
Her third marriage to Charles Gehrman ended in divorce. She loved children and often held parties for them. She loaned them books out of her extensive library. In 1901, Susan met Frank Lloyd Wright and hired him to remodel her home with the stipulation that the fireplace in the parlor would be maintained. Frank Lloyd Wright created the magnificent piece of architecture that we have today. Susan entertained in the house with up to 1,000 guests at an event. She traveled across the world, purchasing souvenirs and trunk loads of items on her trips. This is a trunk that was purchased at the auction and is in private ownership. Susan amassed a lavish collection of jewelry, tapestries, glass, china, books, and much more. By the 1920s, she had moved out of the huge home and lived in the cottage across the railroad tracks. In 1942, Susan had been declared incapable of handling her own affairs. Attorney Earl Bice was appointed to do so. Staying in the cottage became impossible, and so in 1943, at the age of 81, she was housed in a private room at St. John's Hospital with a round-the-clock nurse. She was ill, oftentimes confused, and at times not even knowing her name. On paper, Susan was worth around $250,000, but her assets were tied up and hard to sell in the 1940s. In early July, a newspaper article announced that her properties had been sold to an undisclosed buyer. Properties included a building at Adams and 6th Street, which some may remember as the Rollins Department Store. A three-story building on South 6th Street, which is the former and current cardologist shop. 80 acres of timber land in Logan County and some properties out west. After paying mortgages and other expenses, Susan was left with $100,000. Funds were needed to help with Susan's care, and it was decided an auction of her estate would be the way to raise money. Susan's attorney, Earl Bice, was named the conservator of her estate. In preparation for the auction, he authorized an inventory to be done of all the items in the house. Susan had so many things that the inventory list covers 35 single space type pages. She didn't just collect a few souvenir spoons. No, she had 56. She didn't just have a few scarves, but 109. The inventory includes what was in trunks or on shelves. 81 fans, 257 baking dishes, 56 souvenir spoons, 12 marble knives, 66 handkerchiefs, two pages listed gold rings, necklaces, bracelets, opal rings, diamond necklaces, etc. Bolts of material, 900 yards of silk, linen, satin, velvet, wool, and more. Susan bought the entire bolt so no one else in town had a dress exactly like hers. There were unwrapped items, purchases from all over the world, still in boxes. Ostrich plumes, paintings, Japanese prints, coins, canes, umbrellas, pottery, an artificial Christmas tree, unwrapped. And there were baskets. It is said that an entire room from floor to ceiling was filled with baskets. Furniture was listed but did not indicate whether it was a right piece or where it stood in the house. Another inventory just listed books. Susan had over 2,200 books in her library that covered many topics. Children's books, classics, women's studies, history, and 250 travel books. Some were still in boxes. Part of the inventory referenced the trip the Bices took to cities where Susan had lock boxes. They went to Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, Leadville, Colorado, and Grants Pass, Oregon. At each bank, in every lockbox, they found a jar of parrot feathers. We can only assume the feathers belonged to Polly, her beloved pet parrot who pretty much ruled the Dana house for many years. The house that we now have, which is a magnificent piece of architecture, was considered practically worthless, according to the appraiser John Brinkerhoff. The only value it would have would be the wrecked value, 
due to the fine material in the house that would appeal to a wrecking contractor. The ground is a good piece and could be used for an apartment building. Thankfully, that never happened. Although the name of the buyer of Susan's downtown properties and land remained unknown, later it was revealed that Morton Barker, a partner in the Barker, Goldman, and Lubin Lumber Company, had agreed to purchase the properties through Marine Bank. This included the contents of Susan's house and cottage. There were rumors that the house had been sold, but on July 31st, 1943, an Illinois State Register art Register article read, reports that the Lawrence home had been sold were denied today, but it was revealed that the owners had a nibble. The interested party asked that the furniture of the house not be sold until a decision was made whether he would buy the structure. As a result, sale of the specifically, of the specifically structured furniture has been held up. It was Charles Thomas who purchased the house for $17,000 and stipulated that the furniture stay in it. Charles Thomas used the house for the publishing company of medical books from 1944 to 1981. Thanks to the Thomas family, most of the furniture has been left preserved. Dana Thomas House is considered the most intact of all of the Frank Lloyd Wright homes with 103 pieces of furniture still in the home. Dates for the auction were announced. Starting on July 26th, there would be two auctions a day, one from 1 to 5 p.m. and the other from 7 to 11 p.m. A large tent was erected in a vacant lot on the southwest corner of 4th and Cook Streets. Today, it is once again a vacant lot after the demolition of the YMCA. It was hung with red lanterns and 1,500 wooden folding chairs were set up. A PA system was installed and a smaller tent showcased the coach and Surrey. Auctioneer Luke Gall was hired. While the arrangements were being made for the sale, items were put on display in stores downtown. The Myers department store window drew people to see the baby christening gown. This item had been a subject of gossip over the years as the paper reported on July 27th. Susan had purchased this gown and other baby items during her honeymoon in France in 1912. The never worn gown still carries the original price tag with the price listed in French francs. She was 49, as we mentioned earlier, and had married Jorgen Constantine Dahl, who was 26. Any hopes for a child were shattered the following year when Jorgen Dahl died. Jewelry items were also displayed at Bridge Jewelers. These included a Tiffany designed diamond necklace and a cameo of Susan's father surrounded by diamonds. Word even spread outside of Springfield about the upcoming sale, drawing visitors to purchase some items prior to the auction. Brentano's bookstore in Chicago purchased the library of books and loaded them into a moving van, but the store must not have taken all the books as some were still sold at the auction. We know of certain items that were up for bids on specific days. For other items, we do not know. Opening day, Monday, July 26, 1943. There were three separate auctions on opening day of July 26. At 10 a.m., the contents of the cottage were auctioned off. At 1 p.m., other items were sold under the tent at Fourth and Cook, with men carrying items from the house to the site a block away. No one was allowed in the house itself. And at the 7 p.m. sale, the cottage was sold for $3,175 to Morton A. Barker, the cousin of the Morton Barker from Springfield who had purchased the cottage contents and downtown properties. A $1 admittance fee led to a disappointing attendance of only 400 to 500 people. The total sales were below the total appraisal of the items sold. Pictures framed in heavy gold went for two to five dollars. With low sale prices and a number of attendees less than expected, it was announced the one dollar admittance fee would be scrapped starting on day two. 
Tuesday, July 27, day two. It was another stifling hot day, so much so that a continuous parade of young boys loved buckets of ice water to the bitters. At 1 p.m., the famed baby clothes were sold. We do not know how much the buyer paid. During the 7 p.m. auction, linens, towels, and items from around the world, Chinese screens, Japanese curio boxes, Dutch wooden shoes, and Russian samovars were auctioned off. Each day, newspaper articles listed items that would be sold, not able, though, to list all of the hundreds of items. Wednesday, day three, July 28th. Crowds grew when it was reported that the canvas top tent would have to be elasticized to accommodate large crowds. The fan that Susan purchased in Paris, France for $100 and carried by her to the inaugural of her friend, Governor John Tanner, in 1897 was sold. In the crowd was a former newspaper man who had written about the fan and the inaugural. He bought it for a quarter. We have not been able to locate the article about the fan or who the reporter was. We don't know if it is really true, but the story has been told that even though Susan didn't know much of what was going on, she had lucid times. So it could be true that she said to her nurse, did you know they were selling all of my things? Thursday, day four, July 29th. The fourth day of the sale drew huge crowds for the sale of jewelry. A Brinks armored car delivered the jewelry from its storage at First National Bank. Seven plain clothes detectives with machine guns resting on their hips surrounded the platform of jewels. Up for bid was the necklace designed by Tiffany with 70 diamonds, which Susan had bought for $25,000 and had worn at the court of St. James. It had been appraised at $18,000 that went for $7,000. The newspaper said people were jammed in the tent and out onto the sidewalk. All were quiet as church mouse when Gall asked for the third time, $7,000 for a necklace? The buyer was anonymous, but the newspaper reported it was bought by Frank Bridge of Bridge Jewels. After the auction, it was again put on display at the store. The diamonds were removed and sold for engagement rings. Frank Bridge also bought a cameo of Susan's father, surrounded by 35 white diamonds appraised at $2,100. This was also broken apart, and the diamonds were sold. Notice the picture on the left was taken after the diamonds had been removed. Other jewelry sold included a ring with three pearls mounted in a gold setting and with diamonds. A pendant with diamonds, the largest, one carat and a topaz brooch with diamonds and pearls. At the end of the jewelry sale, $35,000 had changed hands. The Brinks armored car returned the jewels to the bank where buyers picked up their purchases. On day five, a coach was sold. It is called a broom, although some pronounce it as broom. It was on display along with two other carriages a top buggy, and a park phaeton. These were located in a smaller tent adjoining the larger auction tent. The brougham was a model of one that Teddy Roosevelt rode in for his inaugural in 1900. Susan had one made, but it was never used. She said it was too ostentatious and different for Springfield. During the evening sale, a scheduled blackout for a practice air raid, since it was during World War II, left the 1,200 attendees sitting in the dark. For 30 minutes, the people were led in songs. Although the auction had been announced, it would be for five days. At the end of the fifth day, the auctioneer, Luke Gall, said that they had barely scratched the surface, so a sixth day was held. The auction finished up on day six with sales of the last items. One of the amazing parts of the Dana Thomas house is the furniture that Wright designed for the home. The dining room table can seat 40 and had both high back and low back chairs. Women with their tall hats sat in the low back chairs so that the waiters could reach around them to serve food. 
At the auction, it was attempted to get a $1 bid for one chair. When that brought no takers, 50 cents was asked. Again, not successful. So the chairs were returned to the house. In 1993, Christie's Auction House sold one Frank Lloyd Wright designed oak side chair, similar to those in the Dana House, for $51,750. The old Victorian style furniture in the cottage also did not bring much money. Two bird's eye maple dressers, old fashioned but without a scratch and with perfect mirrors, brought $11 and $15. Today, furniture of the same workmanship and quality of material would command prices in the thousands. The Charles Thomas Publishing Company used the house for its headquarters from 1944 through 1981. We have them to thank for making very few changes in the house and keeping the furniture intact. The state purchased the house in 1981 due to the work of Governor Thompson, who saw the value of the house and loved antiques. Soon, efforts began to reacquire items that had once stood in the house. Some people donated items back to the house. The Dana Thomas House Foundation was formed in 1983 by a group of women. A key member of the foundation was R. Lou Barker, who helped establish committees and open the sumac shop. The group began fundraising efforts, along with Governor Thompson and others, to reacquire items from the house that had been sold during the auction. We want to now share some of the items that are back in the home. Some required major fundraising campaigns, while others were donated by families. Throughout the years, items such as jewelry, ceramic and glass vases, doilies and linens, wine bottles and decanters, books and stationery have been acquired. Other items with much more value are also now in the house. Efforts by Site Superintendent Don Hallmark, the Foundation, and individuals were ongoing throughout the 1980s and 1990s. Some were purchased by the Foundation from individuals, families, at auctions, and from antique stores. Some of the items have interesting stories, while other items come with very little information. The Dana Thomas House Foundation has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years to buy back items. Today, the Dana Thomas House is considered the most intact of all of Wright's designs, with over 100 pieces of furniture he designed for the house. The first major acquisition purchased by the foundation was Susan's Broom from 1902 a model of the one Teddy Roosevelt rode in on the way to his inauguration in 1900. It and two carriage lanterns were purchased by the foundation for $2,500 from Robert and Bonnie Prutzman in Indiana. The foundation raised money to restore it, which cost around $3,000. Also a part of the first purchases were Susan's father, Shagbart Kane, and his wood cane with three silver rings engraved RDL. A butterfly woven design piano or library table scarf with gold macrame fringe, a lavender ostrich feather fan, and a black velvet cape. These items were donated to the house in 1994 which were all brought for resale to Estelle Booth, an antique dealer who just happened to be a foundation board member. Through Estelle's negotiations with the sellers, the foundation purchased the items well below market value. In 1988, Governor Thompson raised nearly $690,000. The foundation raised another $10,000 plus to have money to purchase the double pedestal lamp, probably the most famous purchase made. 
The double pedestal lamp of bronze and leaded glass was designed by Wright. The acquisition has quite a story. According to a press release from Thompson's office, there was a near hysteria surrounding the acquisition of authentic Wright pieces and the rapidly escalating prices being offered by collectors. Wealthy collectors were paying astronomically high prices for Frank Lloyd Wright furniture and art glass at that time. The possibility of the foundation retrieving the table, lamp, chair, and two color presentation drawings at Christie's December 1988 auction were remote. Past site superintendent, Dr. Donald Hallmark, related in the October, November, December 1987 issue of Wright in Springfield, what happened next. The national media began to rally to the cause of the Dana House, likened to David, as it attempted to overcome all odds and defeat the market and its moneyed legions, Goliath. Significant articles began to appear in such important newspapers as the New York Times. Governor James Thompson volunteered to do the bidding and most of the competitors contacted him to tell him they would not be against him. Governor Thompson also called personal friends for donations. Other donations arrived from all over the country and in less than five weeks, the foundation had almost $1.2 million in its acquisition fund. Hallmark described the day of the auction. Governor Thompson sat in the front row and one by one, the Dana House items found their way back to the protective confines of home. Governor Thompson returned to Christie's in December of 1998 and successfully bid on one of two hammered copper urns designed for the house. The urn was one of Mr. Wright's favorite objects and appeared in a number of interiors, two for Brown's bookstore, two for his own studio, two for the Coonley House, two for the Dana House, two in the Waller House, and possibly others. One author made the statement that none of the urns are in their original setting. We at the Dana House are pleased to have one of our original urns back at the house. Again, the artifact was paid for by a combination of foundation funds and private money raised by Governor Thompson. The diligence of the early foundation boards and the generosity of Governor Thompson and other donors made so much possible. It is through their efforts that the collection is so complete. As for the double pedestal lamp, it was purchased for $704,001. While walking through Christie's, a private owner sold Governor Thompson the drafting table which was used by Wright in the construction of the house. The cost, $20,000. Thompson was also successful in purchasing four dining room chairs, two tall back and two low back. These were in the holdings of a family in Colorado. It is believed the Thomas family may have sold these to the Colorado family. Other major foundation purchases have included architectural renderings by Frank Lloyd Wright, a pencil and ink of the front facade for $77,000, the entryway for $22,000, and the living room for $22,000. A music stand designed by Frank Lloyd Wright for $77,000. A single pedestal lamp designed by Frank Lloyd Wright for $132,000. Several items were donated by Don Hoffman author of many books about Frank Lloyd Wright, including Frank Lloyd Wright's Dana Thomas House, the illustrated story of an architectural masterpiece. The Hero She Gay print and Jarvie Candlesticks. Another donation came from the Weeby family. A four piece set, including a settee and three chairs had been appraised for at $35 in the 1942 inventory and purchased at auction, twice unknown, by a, a neighbor of Susan, Bill Brown. Later, his sister, Mary Brown Beckmeyer, gave them to her daughter, Marianna Beckmeyer Weedy. 
In 2003, the settee and the chair were donated to the foundation, restored, and given to the house. In 2019, the two remaining chairs were donated by the Weedy family. It is interesting to note that the appraisal of items for the auction listed this furniture set at $35, but the right design dining chairs were valued at 25 cents each. Items were often found at auctions and antique stores. Another auction was held in 1993 at the Patty Doyle Auction Gallery. We thank Patty Doyle for sponsorship of tonight's program. This was the Irene Garvey sale. Irene had been one of two women hired by Susan's lawyer, Earl Bice, to help make the inventory prior to the sale. Each received $125 and possibly were allowed to choose items to keep. Two Tico ware bases were purchased a green matte one for $525, and the other a green matte glaze vase for $450. Tico was produced by Gates Potteries in Terracotta, Illinois, now part of Crystal Lake. The company operated from 1899 to 1966 and was known for modern design that was considered two to three decades ahead of its time. Terracotta was a fired clay, Tico was named by using the first two letters of Terra and Cotta. Frank Lloyd Wright used Tico for the Moon Children Fountain and for the Flower in a Crannied Wall statue. He commissioned Tico to make a vase he designed for the house, and Susan purchased 25 Tico vases on her own from the Art Association in Chicago. Several Tico vases have come up for auction over the years. One that is in the house and was designed by Wright was donated to the house by Ron Bartle, purchased by someone in the Bartle family at the 1943 auction. The Bartles lived across from Susan and the Bartle children often attended her tea parties. A Tico vase sold at Christie's auction on May 27th of this year for $362,500. It is believed that eight were made, but we believe the Dana Thomas house had only one. The pre-auction estimate for this vase was thirty to $50,000. Another Tico vase with a floral pattern, not at all related to Wright, sold at the same auction for $25,000 with a pre-auction estimate of twenty dollars to $30,000. Other items purchased by the foundation at the 1993 auction included Rookwood vases signed by Lenore Asbury, designed with oak leaves, which sold for $1,000, Van Briggle vases, hand painted cups and saucers by Susan, sterling silver souvenir spoons from Salt Lake City with the initials of Runa Lawrence. Many silver items, such as trays, creamer, sugar, coffee pot, and tea caddy, and books, including Snowbound by Whittier and the Lincoln Yearbook by Wallace Rice. Three small fern stands were acquired for the house in 1998 from Westminster Presbyterian Church. How did they end up at the church? One of the two men and women appraisers prior to the 1943 auction was a member of Westminster's. It could be she attended the auction and purchased the tables, or possibly the tables were given to her as compensation for the appraisal work. We know she was the chair of the flower committee at the church, and so the tables ended up there. Later in 1998, a music director at the church became interested in their origin and asked the site superintendent at the time, Don Hallmark, to look at them. He confirmed they were right design tables. The Historic Preservation Agency purchased one table. The Dana Thomas House Foundation purchased the other two for $5,000 each. Items have also been donated from families back to the house. Some of the items have included several patterns of dishes and glass, Havilland and Limoges, that are now displayed in the butler pantry. 62 pieces of Limoges, white with gold trim, purchased by the foundation in 1987 for $1,053. 
been donated to the house in 1994. There are also Limoges patterns of red swag, green leaf, and cornflower. Included are also pieces of china hand painted by Susan. A sterling silver place setting in the Etruscan design was donated. Although not the original set that Susan owned, she had the same pattern. Several items were donated by R. Lou Barker, including the famed christening gown and underdress. And we cannot omit mentioning Susan's pistol. The story goes that she slept with it next to her bed. There are 77 player roles for a player organ displayed in a right design case in the house. A player organ is similar to a player piano. This would have been the way music was played in the house. The Sicilian player was housed behind an oak screen. Paper rolls are punched with holes that are activated by pumping pedals to play music. Wright Studio installed gold-colored dummy pipes to give it the appearance of being an authentic pipe organ. A man who knew the rolls had been put in the dumpster dug them out and later donated them to the site. How often have we thrown out items that are old or no longer in use? Thankfully, this man decided the rolls might be useful and salvaged them. The rolls have the initials of SLD on them for Susan Lawrence Dana. A number of items were not offered at auction, thank goodness. They included the butterfly hanging lights. There were five in the house, four in the dining room, and one in the stairwell by the gallery. A single pedestal lamp and the dining room table and chairs. Interesting items not sold at auction, but donated back include Susan's book, The Eve of St. Ag Agnes by John Keats, with gilt edging published in 1909. Morton Barker Sr. had purchased the house and estate prior to the 1943 auction. His son, Paul, was engaged to Irene Gilman, and Irene was allowed to select one item for herself. She chose the book, signed by Susan. Irene's daughter, Katie Barker, donated the book to the site in 2012. Today, it lies on the table in the bedroom. The Rocking Horse. In 1905, Frank Nipper received a hobby horse for Christmas when he was four years old. He had often been invited to Aunt Susie to enjoy parties and the library. In 1998, Mrs. Frank Nipper visited the house at Christmas time and noticed that the tree in the gallery was being surrounded with toys and wrapped packages. After her husband died, she donated the horse to the house, a hobby horse that is as old as the Dana Thomas house. We are sure that there are many items still out there to be found. We have discovered a few of these items from people who learned about this program and sent us pictures, including a trunk and a candlestick and bowl. We thank them for being willing to share these with us and to continue to care for the items. The 1943 auction was an event the likes we have not seen since. Susan Lawrence Dana continued under constant care at St. John's Hospital until her death three years later in 1946. Her house continues to attract visitors from all over the world. It is a true gem in our city of Springfield.